My name is Rod Ewing. I'm a co-director at CSAC. And it's a pleasure today to introduce one of our own, Herb Lynn, as the speaker for our seminar. Uh, Herb's a senior research scholar for cyber policy and security at CSAC and the Hank Holland Fellow at the Hoover Institute. He has his doctorate in physics from MIT. What's most striking about Herb's work is how much demand he's in. Uh, he has roles with the Aspen Institute, the NATO Center for Cooperative Defense, the Salzman Institute for War and Peace Studies. He serves on the Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. And for the National Academy of Sciences, he serves on the Committee on International Security and Arms Control, to name just a few. He's just published a book, Cyber Threats and Nuclear Weapons. You should all have a copy on your shelf. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, something most of you will know, but for those who don't, he's also made his daughter's cat very famous uh, by writing an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times entitled, What a House Cat Can Teach Us About Cybersecurity. And so Herb, and his daughter's cat will. Uh, <laughs> okay, Herb, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, so I, I was thinking that as I as I came in here for uh, you know half an hour before the seminar was uh, about to start, uh, I wanted to test the technology, right, to make sure it worked. You've all had this experience of coming in and the technology doesn't work. And then you realize that this is the same technology that controls our nuclear weapons. Okay, so that, that, that you, wor you I worry about that, and, and at least those kinds of worries are part of what motivated this uh, the, the, this this study. Uh, if there's a book talk. There's a flyer going around, uh, which will give you a twenty percent discount if you want to get it. Um, here's the one slide version of the uh, of, of of the talk. Okay, the, the really the policy implications of it, and everything that I'm going to say here basically is driving to these uh, five, uh, five bullet points. Okay. Uh, the first is, is, is that the, the entanglement of conventional and nuclear systems, that is systems that, have, that serve both conventional war fighting and nuclear uh, purposes, uh, raises the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation. And that, that to me is, is one of the most important uh, aspects of this book. And is something that is un underappreciated in, uh, uh, in, in the policy community. Second is the observation that the legacy, that is what we have now, the uh, nuclear command and control system has not yet failed catastrophically, right? We're all still here. Uh, and and, and there have been near misses and there have been corrections and, and uh, uh, corrective actions and fixes and, and so on. These slides will make available to anybody, by the way. Send me a note or you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send them out to anybody. Um, and there have been corrective fixes uh, deployed, um, and you know, by definition, any modernized system won't have had that history of operation and being shaken out. Uh, the third point is that there's a fundamental tension between chain, a rapidly changing threat environment and changing your system to meet the requirements of that threat environment and maintaining an adequately an adequately robust secure uh, and secure cybersecurity posture. You can't resolve that tension. That, that, that's always going to be there, and you have to make trade-offs. Okay. This last thing about doing the best practice, that is, there are cybersecurity problems. You, if you find a problem, fix it. Okay. That may seem obvious to you, but that is often not followed in, in, in practice. And the, the last point is that strategic choices can compensate for additional cyber risk to some extent, not completely, but to some extent. And I'll, I'll, I, I will address that. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. There's the book. Okay, uh, on cyber threats. This is just a brief recap. Just you know, three minutes on you know, two 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 minutes on this. Offensive cyber capabilities will reduce the bad guys with cyber, in cyberspace. They can compromise. They can steal information. That's a threat to confidentiality. They can change the information. That's a threat to integrity. Uh, they can make it unavailable. Uh, to, to the other guy. To, to do something bad to the other guy, you need, two, two th you need to do two things. You need to penetrate to the system 
and once you're inside, you have to do something to the system. So the two separate things. And this that ambiguity, sorry, that 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 fact drives a lot of the, the problem with cyber attacks and their, their ambiguity. So because once you penetrate, you can spy, which doesn't change their system at all, or you can destroy stuff, which does change their system at all. And if you're the bad guy and you're watching something happening to you and you're seeing a computer intrusion on in your system, you don't know why it's there. There's no way of knowing. Yeah. Offensive is, is, is a reference only to the nature of the effect. It has nothing to do with purpose, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the purpose. It's a good question. Okay, in general, in pre-war scenarios, offense dominates defense. That is the bad guy, you know, the, the attacker can always get in given enough time before the war starts. Okay. You have to have good intelligence. That is, you have to know a lot about the other guys system and if the other guy has installed yesterday's you know the yesterday's Microsoft patch your your attack won't work whereas the day before he installed the patch your attack would have worked an attribution you're never sure immediately who's attacking you but there are some there are ways that you get some indication over the long run so prompt attribution is hard over the long term uh, attribution is easier although not always guaranteed on strategy we know that it's impossible to, to deter low-level attacks. All of you who are on computers right now are being attacked right now, but all of your protective devices are shielding you from that. Um, but high, it may be possible to, for a high-level attack. That's an interesting question, which we'll get to later. The logic of cyber attack suggests that if you use cyber attack early on, and that you should be using cyber attack early on in a conflict, and that can lead to have that can lead to significant escalation. Right? In practice, nobody really wants to be security. I hate security. It gets in my way. It gets in your way too. You have to do it, but it's a pain in the ass to do it. And it doesn't help you do your job anymore, except it makes your system available when you want it. And if the it's a holistic emergent problem. What that means in, in, in short is that it's not, okay. stay, close to the stay close to the mic. Okay. Um, and what that means in practice uh, is that it's not just a technical issue. Cybersecurity is much more than just technology. Okay. I'm gonna talk about the entire nuclear enterprise from the design and production and stewardship of nuclear weapons all the way down to uh, nuclear operations, every aspect of it. To the extent that there's anything new in this book, it's mostly about the integration of many different aspects of, of, of the problem, cyber aspects of the problem, okay? because cyber affects all of these elements, command and control, the delivery systems, um, the planning aspects of it, the operational aspects of it. And of course, there's an extensive nuclear modernization program happening right now. Here's some of the cyber risks. And by cyber risks, here I'm talking about deliberate cyber risk. That is, a bad guy is seeking to intrude into your system, into, you, into our into US systems. The deliberate choice to compromise our systems in some way, either by stealing information or by destroying programs and, and, and so on. Okay. So it could affect the design and production process, for example, we use the nuclear simul their simulation codes that simulate the explosion of nuclear weapons. If those codes are changed somehow, how it's a different question, but if they could be changed in an unauthorized manner, you, you, know, you, you louse up your simulation results. You may, have, you may screw up the data, you may alter data that's used to verify nuclear codes. Okay, all those things would be bad. You have many nuclear delivery systems. They can be compromised, right? The F-35 has 10 million lines of code in it. Okay. All, of the, all that code is cyber vulnerability. Nuclear command and control. There are many different aspects of it. Um, there, you can have glitches in early warning that signal a false attack. Um, maybe it signals a, uh, maybe it fails to warn you when there's a real attack coming. 
In nuclear planning, nuclear planning relies on a lot of databases. You can corrupt those databases. Nuclear decision making, maybe you confuse a, a conventional attack, an attack on conventional forces, with an attack on nuclear forces. That starts to get accidental, you know, more accidentalish in nature, okay, more inadvertent in, 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 in nature. Uh, maybe you can corrupt the decision-making processes of the adversary by using uh, information operations against them, feeding them bad information through Twitter. Right? At Strategic Command, we see on their big board a Twitter feed at the bottom of it, along with CNN. Um, cyber attacks could cause a disconnect of our command authorities with our nuclear forces. And by the way, you also want to be able to communicate in crisis with your adversaries. Right? In a nuclear environment, you really want to be able to connect with your adversaries, right? How else are you going to stop a war, right? And the idea of being able to communicate that our president is going to connect, is going to talk to the Russian president in the middle of a nuclear war in a nuclear environment, that's highly problematic. I mean, no one really knows how to deal with that problem because the hotline, of course, is in the Pentagon and the Pentagon is located with, I mean, it's ground zero, right? There's a ground zero cafe. There's a restaurant right in the middle of, you know, uh, in the center of the Pentagon, in the courtyard there. It's called ground zero cafe, okay? And the, you know, the, the hotline ends there. Okay? That's not a good idea, <laughs> okay? Okay, so. This is, gives you a sense, so, you know, obviously a, a fictional weapon system, but there are many places where, where you could get access to, the, uh, to it, okay? There's a radar receiver that takes in electronic signals over the air. Okay? There's a radio receiver. There's a wire, there are wireless communications links that, that, that eat information. The operator brings along a cell phone in his pocket, okay, the pilot. There's a USB port in the, in, in the hull for maintenance, okay? Um, there are components in the whole thing that are, are uh, supply through a, a, a law, an extensive supply chain. Okay. All of these are opportunities to tamper with the weapon system. Other points of vulnerability. The maintenance systems there, there's the life support systems there, there's the flight control software, uh, collision avoidance, um, targeting systems, uh, industrial control systems that control the flaps and, and, and the thrust and so on. All these places are things that you could compromise. And all of these systems are supposed to be networked. They operate in a big network, uh, so you know through through DoD networks, and they communicate to themselves among themselves. But they also communicate to the outside world. They communicate to the business systems at the Pentagon. Business systems they order things like oil, and fuel, and toilet paper, and food. Okay, they're all unclassified, as well as ammunition. Uh, require, uh, orders and stuff like that. Their command and control centers back at the Pentagon. Okay. And then all of this stuff is connected, to, is connected to the public internet okay, in some indirect way. In fact, the secret network, the, the one for secret information and below at the Pentagon, this classified network runs on top of the public network, the public internet. And all it is essentially is a virtual private network but it runs on the same hardware. And those are all potential points of vulnerability. What DOD penetration testers could do with simple tools? This is what GAO found. They could take control of a system uh, in one day. They could gain initial access in an hour, okay? Security measures prevented access by remote users, but not by insiders. They were able to take control of the operator's terminals. One of the most interesting things was this last one here. They caused a pop-up message to appear on user terminals say, insert two quarters before proceeding, okay? okay. They able to change and delete system data, okay? Def they use default passwords to access open source, you know, to access open source tools, okay? Um, sometimes testers, the, these penetrations, uh, were detected, but no action was taken. They, re re they were able to reboot systems in operation. All of these vulnerabilities are a fraction of the total vulnerabilities. It didn't test everything. 
tests don't reflect the full range of threats. Sometimes they couldn't do a review because the software was proprietary. Okay. And sometimes they complained the cybersecurity testing would interfere with operations. Okay. Nevertheless, program officials often said systems were secure and they discounted tests as being unrealistic. I'm going to talk about the site. And by the way, some of those systems that, that were identified in the report from, this, from which this was drawn, the GAO report described there, um, they included some nuclear systems as well. OK, on the nuclear connection here. So information technology is the lifeblood of military organization and power projection. Nuclear enterprise is not an exception to that, right? Nuclear command and control relies on computers for every aspect of operation, every aspect of it. And you know, you could make the argument that cyber security and resilience of US nuclear forces, especially nuclear command and control, is of comparable importance to the reliability and performance of the weapons themselves. This is not my conclusion. This is a conclusion of the Defense Science Board of 2017. I agree with it. Just a little review on the uh, basic principles of uh, nuclear command and control. You should never, ever, ever, ever use nuclear weapons without proper orders, but you always have to be able to use them uh, when they are properly ordered. Okay. Note this tension between always and never. Right? There's a fundamental, inherent, unresolvable tension. You can only manage that tension. The military emphasizes the always. We have to execute our orders. When we're given an order, we want to be able to, so we always want to be able to do this when we're ordered to do so. The civilians, mostly peacetime, they say, no, we, I focus on the never. And you can see a tension there. If you're going to attack the always requirement that you would be trying to prevent or interfere with a properly authorized order, that means you want to inhibit the US nuclear, US nuclear action. So you might send communications. A cyber attack might sever communications. It might get in the way of authenticating the individuals who are giving orders. Okay. They may compromise the orders, change the orders, in, uh, change the orders. Um, you may be able to trick insiders into operating foolishly, like not doing what they're supposed to. By contrast, an attack on the never requirement enables the improper insurer the improper issuance of a launch order, of a valid launch order. Okay. And here, for example, it's more, it's more like being able to pretend that you're the president of the United States um, and taking over a wireless link to the ICBMs to enable it to launch under, circumstance, under certain circumstances. Um, and, and here, the, the uh, cyber attacks are, are, are uh, likely to, to focus on, on compromises on trickery of people who are in the who are in the launch command chain. Okay. You might corrupt or interfere with the ability of people to uh, of decision makers to plan and coordinate with each other. Um, confidentiality here is particularly important. If you're conferring with allies, you don't want the you know that that transcript to get out to the New York Times. These are some of the people you might be trying to confer with. Vulnerabilities in nuclear planning. Again, as I said, they, you, you gather information from many different assets, uh, sorry, from many different databases and you have to coordinate them. For example, tankers, the flight schedule of tankers has to be coordinated with the flight paths of bombers. And if the bomber arrives at a certain point in space and the tanker isn't there, you're gonna have an awfully pissed off bomber pilot. Um, Corruption in the databases may not be detected for a long time, especially if it's a rarely used database. Right? If you corrupt something slowly, you don't know necessarily that it's been corrupted. And so your, your backups become corrupted too over time. The result of all of this is that operational plans don't get executed optimally. How do you communicate with adversarial leadership? This is not usually something that's considered to be part of nuclear command and control. I think it should be, 
but it isn't for reasons which I don't quite understand. But you have to have communications with the adversary to affect conflict termination. And you want to be able to negotiate the terms of a ceasefire. Okay. And you have to be able to do this in a nuclear environment with leaders who want to stay hidden and all of whose ground stations are already, you have to assume are known and have already been targeted and destroyed. So he has to have wireless communications. And if you have wire, if you have wireless communications, that means you're emitting and somebody can home in on those emissions. That's not gonna make you feel very secure if, if, even if you're flying around. So, and you're going to have systems on one side and on another side, and they have to interoperate, right? A Russian system and a US system have to be designed to interoperate with each other. That takes a certain degree of coordination. It's even hard to get Microsoft top products to interoperate with each other. And they're by the same company, right? Imagine trying to get a Russian system and an American system to work even the most cooperative environment possible. Some of the cybersecurity lessons uh, for nuclear modernization. Our appetite for information technology functionality is unlimited. We always want our computer systems to do more. Okay? The computers that you have now that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis are the same, are, sorry, are better than the computer systems you had five years ago. They're faster, they do more things, they do more applications, whatever, okay? But fundamentally, the point here is that as you increase your demands on it, the systems get more and more complex. They get bigger and bigger. And every cybersecurity person will tell you that the enemy of security is complexity. Complexity is the enemy of security. More complex systems, more insecurity. More functionality, more complexity, less security. So until you can get a handle on your appetite for more functionality, you're going to be having systems that are more insecure. Okay. And so the, 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 I wish I could take credit for this, but there are, you can choose between a system that is so simple that it obviously has no errors or a system that is so complex that it has no obvious errors. Okay. Number two is a bad way to design a system, design NC3. Okay, and that's why I fear that, 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 we're, that we're going down. Bigger systems, larger attack surface. And just as an example, consider the difference between a system that you need to support nuclear and conventional integration of warfighting efforts versus one that's primarily oriented just to just nuclear. I submit to you the second one is much simpler than the first. How do you build a complex system when the requirements change rapidly? Well, you see various statements from various senior people saying, well, we just have to do this. We have to adopt ways of building systems that are fast. We want to go faster, faster, faster. Okay. We understand the sentiment here. But cybersecurity is inherently a drag on deployment because it doesn't add any functionality for the end user. You can't do anything differently. Really, security just gets in your way. Okay. And so it's always going to be cheaper to develop and faster to develop a less secure system. Always. And so how are you going to, build, how are you going to manage that tension? And you, Silicon Valley techniques for doing software development don't change that, doesn't change that fundamental trade-off. Silicon Valley says, well, let's do stuff. We, we do stuff, we, we put out stuff rapidly. Sure, they do. They, they do a great job of putting out software that changes to user requirements very rapidly. Get closer to the podium, all right. Okay. Um, yes, uh, so Silicon Valley wants you to, uh, wants to produce software that is responsive to users and that's fine. But the, who the user is in, the, in a nuclear command and control system is not clear, right? Is it the commanders? Is it the operators? Is it the national command authority? They all have conflicting requirements. In Silicon Valley, when they produce software, their goal is to provide value for the user. The user is king. 
and they know who the user is, that's the person that gives them money. No such metric in, 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 uh, uh, for nuclear command and control. Okay. There's this trade-off between getting work done and having better security. The success of the commander of NORAD, actually pre-NORAD, what turned into NORAD says that if it's possible to have convenience, if you were willing to tolerate insecurity, but if you want security, you have to be prepared for inconvenience. These words are chiseled in granite at uh, NORAD. Um, and you know, day-to-day -day incentives drive people to ignore security requirements. For example, every one of you has seen the door that says, do not prop this door open, and it's propped open with a brick. Every one of you has seen that. Um, the military is more aligned with the always you with the always function. I remember I, I said that they have more incentives to compromise security functions because security makes it get in the way. In the 1970s, the Minuteman permissive action links, the things the, the things that you needed special code for to enable a nuclear weapon to go off, they were set to all zeros. An eight-digit code was set to all zeros, so that the Operators of the missile could always fire their missiles. The intent was good. You wanted to prevent an unauthorized launch. That came from the civilians. No, no unauthorized launch. The military circumvented that by making them all zeros. They obeyed the orders, but they were all zeros. I want to talk, talk a little bit about some selected, about cyber risk and selected scenarios. Um, there are certain irreducible uncertainties and ambiguities. And this is just a sampling of them when you think about uh, operational scenarios, okay? There's uncertainty in interpreting a signaling image. A lot of political theory is devoted to what does it mean to signal an adversary? You may intend to show restraint, but they'll see a provocation. And how do you get that clear? That's very hard if you're actually not talking to each other. What do your actions say? The other guy doesn't know. We talked about ambiguity in the intent. Okay. We made the comment that our offensive activities are in effect, but they can be done for different purposes. Okay. Is an attack, is a cyber intrusion an attack or is it espionage? Or is it operational preparation of the battlefield that enables you to attack later? You can't tell, you don't know the answer. And there's no way of knowing the answer in advance. There's uncertainty about the nature of a target. Is a target that you're hitting nuclear, non-nuclear or both? And if it's both, which aspect of it is most concerning to you? If you're the attacker, you might say, I just want to deal with the conventional stuff. If you're the defender, you may say, oh, but he's going after my nuclear and you're both right. Is it a military target or a non-military target? Is it an electric power plant? A military or non-military uh, target, unclear. And are you worrying about direct effects on the system that's being attacked or on something that is connected to and then something that's connected to that? And you, you, and you never know what the, what the intended attack, what the target the, in the mind of the attacker is you know, in advance. And then you have these difficulties of prompt attribution. You don't know who is it, who it is that's attacking you right now. And of course, you, the fact that you may know that over the long run, that doesn't help you very much because you have to know now. Scenario one, basically this is a scenario in, in, in which, let's say China announces an attack, uh, a, a, uh, an exercise in which it's going to do stuff with its mobile missiles, it's gonna flush the mobile missiles from the garrison. We need to know whether they're preparing for an attack. So we say, well, the best way to get to do that is to penetrate their nuclear command control system and listen to their orders. Okay. So we do that. This is for perfectly benign purposes. But the Chinese see us in there and say, hey, wait a minute. These guys are in our system now. This is a dangerous situation, right? Because the Chinese now think that we are there for purposes that could be interpreted as disabling their nuclear command and control system. So we're there for benign purposes. They, are, they, they worry that we're not there for benign purposes. You can see how it might escalate. Attacks on dual purpose 
systems. The early warning satellites, we have, or, or the adversary has, you have early warning satellites that are supposed to detect strategic missile launches. And so they're part of the nuclear warning system. But if those systems are used in a conventional war to, to improve the effectiveness of your ballistic missile defense uh, in tactical situations, in regional conflicts, the other guy may try to attack your early warning satellites to, to disable your missile defenses. But then we'll say, no, no, they're going after our early warning satellites or strategic satellites. And they're both right. Both sides are right. And so the person whose satellites are being attacked are going to interpret this in the worst case and be very concerned about an, an impending nuclear attack, where the intent was really only to go after the conventional app. And imagine a situation, a third such a scenario in which um, the adversary conducts a cyber attack uh, uh, through a supply chain, through the supply chain, and selectively disables a couple of nuclear systems and then announces to the, you know, by a tel secure telephone um, that uh, we've done this. And then, you know, we have to prove it, you know, here's some evidence that we did it. And the other guy says, and, and, and you know, and then he proves he can do it. And now we're in a situation where potentially all of our forces have been compromised. That it, it, whatever that situation is, is not good for stability. Does it increase the likelihood that we'll do something? Does it decrease the likelihood? It's not clear, but putting doubts into our mind about what to do is not necessarily a good idea. Okay. Some of the policy implications, I just want to, unpack a little bit of what I discussed in, 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 in the book here. So uh, this question about entanglement, this is the first slide okay, th that I'm now unpacking for further. Okay, the entanglement of conventional nuclear systems raises the risk of inadvertent uh, conflict, nuclear conflict. My claim is that operational advantages in war fighting have to be weighed against an increased escalatory risk. And that's a trade-off that you have to, that, that decision makers have to, have to make. Um, it's desirable to minimize the possibility that nuclear attack, that cyber attacks on conventional assets will be seen as attacks on nuclear. And I propose a number of ways of, of doing that what I, with what I call impact statements um, in procurement and as part of uh, the war planning. You have to moderate the appetite of the designers of nuclear command and control and, and weapon software to, to make everything all singing, all dancing. You don't want software that does all of that. You want to as simple as possible. I think that STRATCOM should have acquisition authority over nuclear command and control, not just be able to set the requirements, but they actually have budget authority. Decision makers ought to have an independent, they ought to have an independent backup system for bare functions of nuclear command and control. For the minimum, or what used to be called the minimum, minimum essential communications network. And you should find a way of assuring communications channels between adversaries even during the war. Talked about legacy NC3 not failing catastrophically. The implication of that is you want to keep the old stuff and the new stuff work, work in operation at the same time and test the new stuff against the old stuff. There's going to be a lot of resistance to that because it's going to cost money. Um, trade off between changing threat environment and maintaining, maintaining adequate cybersecurity. Uh, you have to make trade offs between, between that, and there's no way around that. And you have to be willing to give something up, or else you're going to have bad cybersecurity. Do best practices. That means actually fix the problems you find. That's harder than it sounds. Okay. Many, many of you in this room may have patch, security patches that you should have installed on your. Windows system that you haven't yet, or on your Mac that you haven't yet installed, um, and, it, and, and, and it's hard. And this last point about strategic choices being able to, to compensate for uh, additional cyber risk to some extent is the following. There is the question, you know, we have this question about you want to eliminate the launch on warning risk. Okay? Launch on warning risk is you, you risk launching an attack by mistake because you have incoming warheads that are gonna destroy your system, your, your ICBMs. 
And what do you do about that? And if you want to take that, you, if you take that off the table, then you have a lot more time to figure out what's going on. And my, I will assert that as the probability of an attack on the ICBMs decreases, the risk of cyber failure relatively goes up. It's, it's a relative position. And therefore, uh, if I'm more worried about, if I start to become more worried about cyber, I want to start thinking about that. Now, it is my, also my claim that reconfiguration of nuclear forces can also buy down some of the cyber risks associated with short warning times. We've talked about different, you know, different basing modes. One of the ways of doing it is just, of course, getting rid of the ICBMs. But if you really want to keep the ICBMs, there are other ways of basing them and, and so on that are less vulnerable that take away from the launch on warning, uh, the need for doing launch on warning. So as, as, as closing thoughts, senior management at DOD does understand the importance of cyber. And the people on the ground who are actually at the keyboards, they understand it. It's the guys in the middle that don't understand it. They're, in my experience, they're the most workers. They're the ones who think everything is fine. Yes, we've gotten the orders from above. I've issued orders down below. The guys down below are doing the right thing and I don't have to think about it and they're wrong, okay, as the GAO found. Someone once asked me, what's the difference between cyber threats and, and, and against nuclear versus cyber threats and conventional? And that's a good question. Um, there's two observations. One is that the cyber threats against uh, nuclear forces uh, is likely, if it's a deliberate attack, is likely to be better and more, more well-resourced. You're gonna get your best hackers to go after the nuclear, to, to go after the nuclear, more resources and so on. And sophisticated nation states are in a position to deploy a lot, to throw a lot at that problem. And the second is just, yeah, I'm gonna say the thing's obvious, the stakes are higher because nuclear weapons pose a, an existential risk that conventional weapons don't. And so I'll, I'll, cl I'll close on that and, and uh, open it up for some discussion. Thanks. All right, so uh, the paper is open for discussion. Let me remind those who are zooming into uh, this seminar to use the uh, Q&A on Zoom as a place to put your questions. And toward the end of the hour, we'll uh, try to get to as many of those questions as, as possible. Uh, we'll begin with uh, our tradition of allowing uh, the fellows, students to uh, pose the first questions. So yeah, please stay. And say who you are. Yeah. I heard great talk. Uh, my name is Steve Bowen. I'm a second year fellow here at CSAC. Um, my question deals with automation. So I'll preface the question by saying that your talk reminded me so much of uh, Dr. Strangelove, except it wasn't funny. Um, <laughs> and what I experienced or what I was worried about when I first saw the movie was that all it would take was one intervention in the decision-making process to set off a chain of events that was more or less automatic the rest of the way through. And even in the era of bombers, when there were several steps, they were all automated and all you would need is that one intervention. To what extent does automation uh, in the decision-making and the technical processes factor into your account of uh, cybersecurity threats? Because it was mentioned with the LOWs that that was something that would just trigger. Um, I wonder to what extent that this is something that um, people in the national security community are concerned about or discuss at all? People, people who worry about launch on the, the risk of launch and warning are very aware of this. Um, for, I, I want to emphasize that the, the, the way the nuclear command and control system works is not, it is not you press a button and then electronic signals go out and then missiles get launched. That's not how it works. There are human beings actively involved in at many points uh, to authenticate, to confirm, et cetera, that, that, that these orders are valid and then they press the right switch and, and, and so on. Now you might say that those, that those people are acting as essentially, you know, flesh computers. <laughs> okay, you, you, and, and there's a sense in which the, um, 
the military likes to, to say it, that, that that's what we mean by personnel reliability, they'll follow orders and, and so on. But in fact, they're only allowed, they're, they're only supposed to follow valid orders, okay, legal, legally valid orders. And there, you know, then there are interesting questions there and, and uh, uh, about what constitutes a legally, you know, a, a legal order. Um, people think about this a lot. The tension, the fundamental underlying tension that you raise has never been resolved because the orders from the president are presumptively valid. And yet, you know, we've seen cases in, in, in which people say, well, maybe not. You know, I mean, certainly that happened in, in the Russian case. There was one Ru Russian watch officer who, who violated orders uh, to, to save the world. Now, you know, would it, if he had let the orders go through, you know, let the, the warning go through, what would have happened? Nobody knows. I'm glad we didn't find out. But we, I mean, you know, maybe nothing bad would have still happened under those circumstances. Um, but he certainly violated orders. Nobody, nobody doubts that. So, okay. additional questions from the fellows. All right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Please identify yourself. Paul Edwards. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Senior research scholar. So, why would, you know, with regard to the last bullet that's on your screen there, why would an adversary want to try to uh, compromise an entire nuclear weapons infrastructure? knowing that they might fail, you know, with even one or two or three weapons. So, you know, the question is, they'd have to be, somebody who was trying to compromise your, the, the whole infrastructure would have to be very sure that their compromise was going to work. Compromise they, intended to do what? Well, to disable it. You mean to, to make it less likely to function? Yes. Okay. And so what do you, and so what do you say? Well, so, you know, presumably you, you do that because then you would attack with conventional forces and be safe from a, a nuclear attack or maybe attack with nuclear forces and, and, and follow up with conventional ones. But why, I'm just not understanding what the, the, the concept of, uh, uh, of disabling a, a, an adversary's force. Would nuclear be. force, you mean, yeah. why, why would they, for the same reason that they believe in doing um, dam, uh, counter force strikes of any sort. A, a cyber attack, a Russian cyber attack on the United States, for example, for, on our nuclear forces, would serve the same function as sending over, you know, SS-29 or whatever the, back in my day, it was SS-18, um, uh, nuclear war to disable our, 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 our Minutemen, you know, to kill our Minutemen, okay? So the idea is that you want to inhibit a U.S. nuclear response. And... You know, they can do that by trying to sink our ballistic missile submarines to get the bombers in, you know, on the ground and get the silo, get, you know, destroy the missiles in the silos. Cyber is another way of, of, of trying to do that. So that, that's a possible rationale. I'm not saying I would recommend that to them, but, but that's, you know, that, that's a rationale for, for why they might want to do it. Does that, have I answered your question? Yeah, I think. Okay. What's the risk that the bad guy gets into the U.S.? fully understand uh, possible effects that uh, the bad guy may not be trying to achieve. And does that then maybe deter the bad guy from doing that in the first place? Ah, okay. So th th there are two separate questions there. Well, the first question is, what's the risk that the bad guy uh, mucking around in a system that he doesn't really understand will have some will, will do something that he didn't intend to do um, that that might cause some inadvertent effect. I think the the likelihood of that is high, personally. Okay, um, I probably shouldn't say this when I'm on Zoom, but you know when when you're in a when you're in a system and you don't know what you're doing on it, the likelihood of making a mistake is is, is much higher. Okay, that that I, I know that from personal experience. <laughs> okay. Um, and so, yes, I worry about that. And you can certainly imagine cases in that, that you know, something happens. So for example, they're attacking a, uh, uh, an asset and it, it serves both nuclear and conventional. And then they're trying to just go after the conventional, but they are unable to do that. And something bleeds over into the nuclear. Okay, so that's, that's an example of something that could happen. Okay, so I think the likelihood of that sort of thing is high. 
whether it will deter them from doing that, that's a much, that, that's a psychological question, okay? And depends on the persuasiveness of the hackers over there that says, no, no, I have this under control. I can do this. So this is part of why I want, when I teach my students, I want my students to be skeptical of technology, to not believe the assurances that, there's, that their technical experts give them when they're high confidence, oh yes, we, can, we know we can do this. I, you know, I, I really don't want my students to trust technology. <laughs> um, and, and this is, this is, this is part of it. I, 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 want my, I want decision makers to be skeptical of the reassurances that the technologists know, always know what they're doing and they're always in full control. Because more often than not, they are not in full control. And, and so that, that part of it terrifies me. All right, a follow-up question from Vale Gates. Uh, Vale Gates on this uh, mm -hmm. issue of probability. Uh, the question is, how likely do you think a major cybersecurity disaster that affects nuclear systems uh, is today, was in the past, and will be a few years from now? Uh, was in the past um, not very high. Today, a little bit higher, but not much. And in the future, much higher. That's those 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 are, those are my those are my answers, and I don't like those answers, but I think that that that's in effect uh, where we're headed. Um, I don't. I mean, I I see much of what I've done here. I mean, I I've been able to get some of this briefing to the nuclear posture review. Whether they're going to pay any attention to this sort of stuff, or, 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 but I'm still you know, dominance in high technology. You know, high tech is the way to, is, is the wave of the future and, and so on. And it says more and more complex systems. And, and I just don't, you know, I just don't, I fundamentally question that underlying premise. And that makes me very unpopular. Um, so I think, I think the, the, I think the cyber risk is, is, is growing and, and uh, it's because of this demand for more and more functionality. Hi, I'm, I'm Julia Steinberg. I'm an undergraduate. Um, earlier, you were talking about the systems of technology that come out of Silicon Valley, which obviously surrounds us, and how consumer demand, e.g. more complexity, drives the products they make. Given that the United States military is a very big spender, uh, you just said that they really like to be technologically innovative have the highest degree of technology if they realize that it's such a big security threat as i'm sure they do why don't they partner with uh, companies like microsoft or uh, other weapons many or weapons manufacturers to make sure that there are safer products being used that are on the simpler side mostly the stuff that they're using as far as i can tell is custom made i mean there's there's very little you know de demand for you know commercial demand for nuclear command and control systems <laughs> uh, and and so you you don't you know you, you the, the the architects are 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 not you know you don't have the architects working in the civilian sector i mean there's a you know it's, it's a very specialized niche application um and 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 so th that that's very hard they you know the only people they know with any experience are the traditional prime contractors and boeings and, and, and lockheeds and, and and so on um you say they know you say they know uh they they know about this trade-off between functionality and security actually they don't um what i mean by what i mean by that is here, here here's the way i'm gonna character i'm gonna character it and in fact i have a quote in the in, in the book on this they will say, we have a bunch of requirements, functional requirements. Okay? And they throw it over the transom and say, make this as secure as you can. Okay, that's, that's a way to, that is a way to do it. But notice in that model, there's no room for the security guy to push back and say, no, you have to change this requirement because it makes it too insecure. They don't have that conversation. The person in the room the people in the room who are, who are determining the performance requirements, the functional requirements, don't put security as a function. 
I mean, it's it, it's a constraint, and that's 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 very different. The current Stratcom commander has said, cybersecurity or security cybersecurity has to be an additive requirement. He wants to say he he says that it has to be in a, you know, in addition to performance, in addition to to speed, you know, and all this other stuff. That's better than it was before, because when it when it never was. But he's not saying I am sometimes willing to trade off lower functionality for better security. He has not said that. And until he's willing to say that, I think we're hosed. That's that's the issue. And I don't think that I don't think that's happening. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, uh, hi, my name's uh, Ethan. I'm a uh, uh, undergraduate and uh, I'm taking Professor Wynn's one of Professor, Professor Wynn's classes uh, this quarter. But I guess my, my question is about um, the ambiguity you were talking about between cyber espionage and um, cyber attacks in NC3 networks. Um, I guess specifically, and you kind of said that it's inherently ambiguous, but I guess are there, is it is it possible or is it practical to build um, build these sort of like worms or uh, I don't know the technical term. So cyber intrusions would only have a surveillance function like as a confidence building measure, would that be possible or feasible or would that inherently limit uh, the uh, the available like um, attack vectors or attack surface that that uh, that the offense could use um, uh, to uh, to gain access to the system? I think what you're saying is, is, is it possible to design an intrusion where the purpose is unambiguously one or the other? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from as far as I can tell, I don't, I can't give you a rigorous proof of this, but as far as I can tell, with the current architecture of digital computers, which is a von Neumann ar architecture, in which essentially data and programs are indistinguishable, they're all ones and zeros, you can't do it. As far as I know, I, I, and I, I, if there's somebody who can give me either a refutation of that claim or a defensive, a more rigorous defense of that claim, I'd like to, to hear from you. But I, I, I think that it's, it's inherent in the von Neumann architecture that you can't, that you can't distinguish, but because you can't distinguish between programs, you can't do the kinds of things that you're talking about. Uh, Dan Green, postdoc at CSAC. Um, I was wondering what kinds of interventions or experiences do you think have the potential to cause mid-level managers of the nuclear command and control system to care more deeply about cybersecurity? Um, when some of them start getting fired? I mean, in, in, in the end, that, there, there have to be consequences for, for this sort of stuff. A Navy commander that runs the ship aground, doesn't matter whether or not it was his fault, or whether he was asleep in his cabin at the time or, or whatever, that commander is, is almost always relieved of, you know, relieved of command. And in the Navy, they take seriously, you know, running a ship aground. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, and people lose their commands over it. I've never, ever, ever, ever heard of anybody losing a command or rank or something like that uh, because of, of, of presiding over a, a cybersecurity breach. Never. proposals out there now in the arms control control realm is to get all sides to agree that cyber attacks on NCA are banned. Can you foresee any technical means of verifying such a ban? No. Um, un unfortunately, I, I, this is something that I mean, I Especially because you have national I, I, I know how to send an image through a Twitter feed to somebody reasonable that will affect your phone. It displays a photograph that comes over Twitter and now your phone is infected. You can imagine that now. So I, 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 can't, I, I can't see it. 
if there's anybody out there who would like to test me on that again i would like to i'd like to hear from hear from them but i i have i've, I've looked at these things as very as carefully as i can and i can't i can't see that happening Hello, my name is Deborah Chan. I am an undergrad here. I'm curious, so obviously even within, not just in the DOD, but also within Stanford's own international security program, we have classes like Hacking for Defense that are very popular that are focused on this, let's push forward, let's innovate as fast as possible. I'm wondering if you think that there's any way to sort of divide the mindset of pushing forward and innovating in conventional and then separating that from restraining on the nuclear side. Is that possible or do you think that with such a big bureaucracy, you kind of have to stick with one or the other. I mean, it, it strikes me that the, you know, so let, let me, how do I say this? Agile DevOps, which is a, a buzzword that people use for the Silicon Valley as a shorthand for Silicon Valley ways of developing software is perfectly good for some things is absolutely the right thing to do on even on many things, okay? But it's not always the right thing to do. It's absolutely the right thing to do, for example, if I know who the user is. If you're a pilot and, I, and, and you wanna know the best configuration of displays and, 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 and colors on the screen and, you know, and, and so on, you want to pay attention to what that user says. And you, that, that's a great environment for, 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 for DevOps. I do not want a DevOps environment to drive command and control uh, system requirements when there's a pilot who wants to drop a nuclear weapon on a target of opportunity and who gets who's frustrated that he has to get higher authority to sign off on it. To me, the getting in his way of getting you know the president to sign off, I want that impediment there. Okay. And that's not a tension that's ever going to go away. So in that kind of a in that kind of an, uh, an environment, I, I can't see uh, quote DevOps giving the user what he wants because it's not clear who the user the user is. Um, so that's a, that's a deal. So I think the answer is you do you you do you know you you do DevOps in some situations, but not in all situations. And the wisdom is in trying to figure out which is which. All right. Uh, the last question is from David Elliott. He says, right now, the strategic stability dialogue is underway between the U.S. and Russia as a follow-up to the Biden-Putin move. Uh, to your knowledge, are the vulnerabilities that you have laid out in any part of those discussions? Not in track one. Uh, I'm involved in track two with the Russians uh, through the National Academy of Scientists, and their their CSAC, and we meet with the Russians you know, track two Russians all the time about this, and and we we talk about this, um, but they they're they're frustrated about it too. So, all right. Herb, okay. that brings us to the end of the hour. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, for thanks for th thank thank thank. And I'm willing to answer any questions if anyone wants to send me email or anything. So thanks. And my apologies to those who send in questions that we didn't get to, but uh, we're out of time. Send email. Yep. <laughs>